if you like betting on golf, but everyone that you back misses the cut, get some experts involved, with all the stats and the tips and so much more, cause it's the golf betting system, the golf betting system, it's the golf betting system. Greetings and welcome to the Golf Betting System Podcast 230. This is our 2022 Kazoo Open de France Tips Podcast. Paul Williams and Barry O'Hanrahan join me, Steve Bamber, to discuss our selections for this week's DP World Tour action. Good morning, gents. Morning, guys. Morning, guys. Please subscribe to this podcast as you drive the popularity of the show. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit begambleaware.org for more info. And of course, please bet responsibly. Visit our world famous golf betting system website with our in depth betting preview for the Open de France. We've got tournament form statistics, form charts, including combined course plus current form, and a DP World Tour predictive optimizer. It's all free of charge. There is no pod, uh, no paywall. We're available on Twitter. Paul is at Golf Betting. Barry is at A Good Talk Golf. I am at Bamford Golf. Subscribe to the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where this podcast is available along with my weekly golf betting show. Plus, you can join our Golf Betting System Facebook group. The link is available in the description box. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts as ever. For those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. Now, I mentioned last week we were absolutely 100% out of five-star reviews. So, Robert from Glasgow came to our rescue. It's exactly the same situation for next week, chaps and lasses. If you could write a five-star review, it's very, very likely that I'll be reading it out next week because the cupboard is bare. But uh, thanks to Robert, he's in Glasgow. He's written this. Unbeatable Golf Chat is the title. Five stars. This podcast is fantastic. Three great guys. The website is world class. Golf punters must listen to this. Short and sweet. Thanks, uh, Robert. Much appreciated. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Thanks Thanks for taking the time to uh, give us the review, Robert. And as Steve said, if anyone else wants to contribute, that would be very much appreciated. A bit of a strange week this week, isn't it? We've got no, D, uh, we've got no PGA Tour action. Mm. We've clearly got the President's Cup over in Carolina. We wasn't really going to focus on that too much. It's difficult to focus on an event where the home team is seven to one on to win. Um, from a betting perspective, it seems a bit of a close shop. Yeah, but Barry, you did say off mic that there might potentially be something in the fact that the pres- that the internationals hang on and hang on during the team matches. But at that point, clearly in the singles, the uh, the Americans walk away with it. I mean, it's not Any exactly views? a not exactly a firm belief that that will happen, but just hopeful in terms of a fan's perspective that you know they hang with them in the team side of things, and then yeah. at least going into the singles, you, there's a there's a chance. But uh, yeah, it doesn't um, it doesn't bode it doesn't look good on paper right now. But you never like you just never know. Match play is a funny thing. The the internationals could get a bit of uh, I don't know, a bit of momentum and, and make a game of it. But yeah, I feel it feels like um, the writing's on the wall, unfortunately, which which kind of takes away from it as a spectacle. I think the president's cup has been undoubtedly hit by Liv. Yeah, you know, the fact that Cam Smith's gone and won. Uh, in Chicago last week, yep. uh, Wacky Neiman. There's some decent internationals that have clearly uh, jumped the fold. So, yeah, it's a difficult one. Should we talk about what happened actually on the DP World Tour and the PJ Tour last week? Let's start PJ Tour. What an incredible finish at the Fortinet Championship. That was mad, wasn't it? Absolute mad. 80 or 72nd hole. 
with uh, Danny Woodett three putt in that final hole. What is he, three and a half feet away with the first putt? But uh, you could see the look on his face when Homer chipped in, couldn't you? It was that kind of wry smile. And, uh, yeah. you know, you'd still expect him to do it. Um, £14,000 was matched at 1.01 on Betfair. Oh, no. At, <laughs> on uh, on uh, Danny Willett at that point. 14 k 14 grand, yeah. Um, yeah. That was from Steve Rawlings, on Bet, uh, who, who uh, writes for Betfair on, on Twitter. Yeah. So uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, give Steve a follow. He's always good value for that kind of stuff. But yeah, 14 grand and... Uh, Homer was matched a thousand on Betfair as well to win. <laughs> so. And was it was was this like in the last few seconds before it unfolded, like when Homer was in the swale in front of the green? Yeah, I mean, at that point, it, they, you'd looked at those two positions, given what the yeah. uh, the players, respective players, needed to do to actually get the result that they did, and uh, you can see why it was priced at such you know such a low rate, but yeah. Man. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, to not even go to, not even get to a playoff, to skip straight to a win. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he put put a um, a brave face in it afterwards, Danny, didn't he? And talked about how pleased he was with the state of his game in general. But that's got to be through gritted teeth. It was. Uh, it's got to be a painful one to take. I think. He seemed. He seemed to take it quite well. I mean, in so far, probably, uh, you know, at least 850 times better than I would have taken it. Mm. So it, it it seemed like he was taking satisfaction from the performance of the week and separating that from the result yep. in, in as much as he could, you know, given the the um, gut punch he just received. But that's, I mean, I guess that's um, from a me- you know mental state of his game, that's a really great position to be in. So the result... You know he's he's playing for the satisfaction of playing well, or mm. he's getting satisfaction out of playing well, and then a win is a bonus. Obviously, he wants a win, but um, it seems to be a, a good a good place to get to after put, implementing some you know swing changes. Yeah, is that kind of ran, well, random player? He's he's well capable of winning a big tournament, but it does always seem to be interspersed with a lot of missed cuts. So trying to. For trying to find the the right solution with Danny Willett, um, unless you just black it back in blindly and uh, put up with the fact that there are going to be some very long stretches of blank weeks. Um, but yeah, 125 to one I saw about him last week, and you know, for a player of undoubted quality, um, no record previously at the forty net before to speak of. So um, you can understand why his price was where it was. But even so, backable. So- to back you up, Paul, 7th at the 3M Open, 67th at the Rocket Mortgage Classic, missed cut of the Wyndham, didn't make the PGA to a FedEx Cup playoffs. So I think he's playing off a reduced... I think he's 126 through 150 on the status chart. Mm. Then he came to Europe, ninth in uh, at Cron, at the European Masters, missed cut of the Wentworth, when we mentioned him on the podcast, as the kind of guy that might just sneak up. And second at the 40 net. He's up to 88th in the world rankings now. So uh, he's, he jumped 60 odd spots last week with that mm. result. Yeah. And clearly, all of those, uh, all of those exemptions from his Masters victory, they're all in the rear view mirror. So he needs to be in a decent position in the world rankings to get into the better tournaments now. Yeah, yeah. Just adds clarity, doesn't it? Adds clarity to a player. I have to deliver. I have to do something. Yeah. And again, you know, we started the Ryder Cup qualification process and uh, Daniel will have his eye on a position as well, given uh, given there's going to be a few spots up for grabs this time next year. How many, spots did we, how many spots did we work out last week, chaps? Yeah, probably four that or five. We thought there's, there's, there's going to be four or five spots that has to be taken by clearly players that are no longer either on the DP World Tour or PJ Tour. Fresh blood or old players that can find form again, like a Francesco Molinari or Danny Willett. Mm. The door's wide open now for Ryder Cup. Yeah. Yeah, it's like an informed Danny Willett on your Ryder Cup team. You'd be happy about that. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So that was just crazy. So Homer duffs his third, standing there over the ball. 
He's one shot behind Danny Willett, who's in the fairway on the par 5, 18th. He then chips in to level Willett's score. And then Willett hits it on the green for two. and th- and uh, No, so he chips on. It has uh, two putts for victory, three putts. Uh, sorry, two putts for the playoff, three putts for a loss. Madness. And three and a half feet. But these things happen, don't they? These they do. Happen. And uh, yeah, over in over in Europe, Robert Backentire got his uh, second European Tour win, cracking final round sixty four. He closed with, um, and that was despite a little bit of a late wobble as well, a couple of bogeys coming home. Um, and at that point, it looked like Matt Fitzpatrick could get the job done, but uh, but yeah, he rallied and beat Fitz in the playoff. And uh, yeah, we, we've looked at. McIntyre, you know, we've backed him a number of times in the past. It's interesting listening to him in the interview afterwards because he was saying that he didn't think the course particularly was going to suit him at the start of the week. Didn't think his game was quite there, even though he'd been doing a lot of work with uh, with his coach or coaches. Um, but yeah, push came to shove. He really, uh, he really did push on on Sunday, which uh, you can't begrudge a guy who goes out and makes ten birdies on a on a final day to win a tournament. That's uh, that's pretty good going. Um, from my perspective, I had uh, Antoine Rosner. He was handy throughout the tournament, really, but couldn't push on 16th in the end. Molinari was 13th going into Sunday, but shot 74, so that took him out of it. Um, most disappointed with Jost Lauten, really, because he was in a great position, playing nicely um, up to halfway, fifth at the halfway point, and then his back went. Um, he really had problems with it for the final two rounds. Uh yeah, he stuck around. He tried to play through it. Shot seventy seven, seventy four. Drifted all the way down the uh, the leaderboard in the end, and has had to withdraw this week to try and sort it out, which is pretty disappointing because I really fancied he'd go well and potentially push on for a place or better at that halfway point, but it wasn't to be. Sadly, what can you do? Fiftieth, fiftieth at Wentworth, McIntyre. Sixty eight for strokes going off the tee. He lost almost three strokes. Oh yeah. And I looked at him. I, I had a proper good look at him before. The, uh, Negative on approach. He was 65th tee to green. Lost almost two strokes to the field. Did putt well at Wentworth. And then all of a sudden, 6th for tee to green. 19th off the tee. 11th for approach. 9th yep. for putting. Wins the tournament. Something just clicked. Telegraphed. See, lads, what, you, what, you're, what we're missing here in the raw numbers is Rory McIlroy saying a few choice words to him about, like, you know, what, you know, the next generation has to step up for the Ryder Cup and that kind of seems to merge with what McIntyre's goal is and he gets the blessing from King Rory and he just gets the, the belief and off he goes. Mm. Absolutely. It's, it, it, it's just psychology. It has to be. It, at the, at the, that level of the game, just that one, two percent just seems to just click for guys. You get that little bit of backstory after the win, which would be nice in advance when replacing bets on the event, but... <laughs> You get that little bit of context, you know, down the week about like how their mind was framed going into that week, and all of a sudden you turn like crappy long game into like superstar long game and a win. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This oh, is it- why golf betting is so hard. We always say like the, the most valuable metric we could possibly ever have is strokes gained mental game. Mm. What what percentage health is their mental game in that particular week? Yeah. Yep. What are these intangible factors that are going to help you pick the uh, pick the right guy in the right week? It's what keeps us going, boys. Keeps us digging, trying to find these players who are going to going to make us a few quid. Let's talk. Kazoo, open de France, open de Français. <laughs> We're back at the Golf National. We haven't been here for a long while, have we? No, no, in your finest French, Steve, you must have uh, you must have nailed that GCSE French back in the day. Yes, we haven't been to Le Golf National since uh, 2019 due to COVID, so the last couple have been cancelled, which is a shame, really, because it's always a good course for us to uh, return to. Loads of uh, loads of history. Uh, they've been playing here since 1991, on and off, um, and exclusively here since 2002. So. If you're digging through the stats on the site this week, there's loads of Le Golf National uh, data to uh, to pour over this week on the website. 
on the combined stats and also the event stats. So do take a look. Yeah, I guess the field's starting to drift down in terms of quality again after some uh, some decent couple of weeks. In fact, next week's Dunhill Links looks like it's going to be a cracker as well. So um, it's no surprise really we've taken a little bit of a step back in terms of the field. Patrick Reed is the 16 to 1 favourite, marginal favourite from Thomas Peters. Same price available, but there's uh, only a few bookies going 16 to 1 on Reed. It's more widely available on Peters at the same price. Uh, last week's winner, Bob McIntyre, 20 to 1. Victor Perez, 20 to 1. He played well last week, had a chance of making the playoff at the, right at the end. Didn't quite get there. Jordan Smith, 22s. Adrian Moronk, 28 to 1. Same price, Ryan Fox, same price, Antoine Rosner. Rasmus Hogard, 33s. Adrian Atagi, 33 to 1. 40 to 1 bar that list of players that I've just read through. Again, there's. Lots of each way offers, each way terms to pour over this week as well. Boyle Sports, eight places each way. Coral Labrooks, William Hill, all eight places each way. A fifth of the odds. Bet365, again, as we've been saying, their each way extra proposition is also running this week. So they have the standard markets and eight places each way, with fifth of the odds market. And you can go all the way up to 12 places if you prefer. There's different options on there. And again, there's an explanation on my preview which was published this morning, Tuesday, um, at the crack of dawn. Um, so if you want to read through that, take it, take a look through and uh, and see what you think. Um, Albatross course at Le Golf National. As I say, it's been uh, used for a number of years. 7,247 yard past 71 stadium course. It's an exposed course. It's very challenging. We've seen it a number of times and it, it's, it's, it's never a pushover. Style-wise, I always class it as almost an inland links. I do look at linksy style results when I'm trying to work out who wins this particular tournament. Uh, speedy bent grass greens. There's a well, there's a little bit of a mix of meadow grass in there as well, but predominantly bent grass. If they can get the right temperature and the right uh, conditions, then usually up to about twelve and a half on the stimp. So that's pretty fast from a DP World Tour perspective and they're probably going to get to the right conditions this week actually it should be dry um it's going to be mainly cloudy a little bit of sunshine now and again temperatures low 70s just into the 70s fahrenheit i think this week pretty much no wind i mean it did look a little bit windier at the start of the week when i st started uh, looking at this uh, this event or the back end of last week but the wind forecast seems to have dropped to virtually nothing so you kind of looking five ten miles an hour max most days which um whether it makes it particularly easier i'm not entirely sure because this course when it's firm that is its main defense undoubtedly um you know if it's firm and windy it can be absolutely brutal but even without any wind it can still be pretty tricky um, i'll put that into context because um we can go through some of the winning scores here and some, some of the winners and that might give us a flavor as to what to expect 2010 was miguel angel jimenez at 80 to 1 he won at 11 under par thomas levey won the year after 140 to 1 at 7 under marcel cm 70 to 1 eight under par in 2012 gmac won um, two consecutive events 25 to 1 12 to 1 at nine under and five under respectively 2015 was burnt wiesberger 33 to 1 13 under par that's the deepest the scoring's got um in these this string that i'm going to read through tong chai won in 2016 at 66 to 1 he was 11 under par 2017 was tommy fleetwood 22s at 12 under 2018 was Alex Noren at 16 under par. He sorry, 16 to 1. He was 7 under par. And the last winner here was Nicholas Colsart at 100 to 1. He won at 12 under par. So winning scores ranging from 5 under through to 13 under as the deepest number. And yeah, really quite consistent within the middle there, somewhere in the kind of 9, 10, 11, 12 under wins it depending on how soft or firm it is and depending if there's a bit of wind around or not if i was to have a guess right now i'd say it'll probably be towards the upper end of that i think it'll probably be 12 13 that kind of number simply because there's no wind um but i still think it's going to cause uh you know, cause the players to, to have to pay a lot of attention it will still be a challenging track 
um, because that's the very nature of Le Golf National. Now, if you listen to some of those names, and you were talking about Colsarts, Fleetwood, Wiesberger, it's no surprise really that high greens in regulation um, from traditional stats has worked well here in the past. And putting that into context, Colsarts was third for greens in regulation, Noren was fifth, Fleetwood was first, that's no surprise at all. Bernd, Bernd Wiesberger was second for greens regulation. So if you're finding lots of greens, then you're going to put yourself into a very, uh, well, have a good platform to go well in this event is probably the best way to describe it. Now, if you miss greens, then you're scrambling these to be absolutely spot on because it is really quite tricky here. So um, first and foremost, find your greens. If you can't, you need to be pretty mercurial around the greens. And, and if you've got neither of those, then I'm not sure you're going to make the weekend, to be honest. Uh, we've only got some strokes gain stats from 2019. That's the only year we've got any data for. Colsarts was fourth for off the tee, seventh for strokes gain approach, second for strokes gain tee to green. So three very big long game pointers there. George could say he was third. He was eighth for strokes gain approach, fourth for strokes gain tee to green. So very consistent there. JB Hansen came second, um, his exception um, to the rule this week. He was second for strokes aim putting and actually managed to find a way to putt his way around the Golf National last last time we were here. But I'd say that's very much the exception rather than the rule. I'd, uh, I would err on the side of long game performance every day of the week on this particular course. Um, only other things to grab onto really incoming form most of the players there's a little bit of form but it tends to be solid you know if unspectacular incoming form gets the gets the win here and that's kind of reflected by some of these prices you know Thomas LeVay 140 to 1 Colsart's 100 to 1 lots of 80s and 70s and 66s in there as well so Picking a player with a, a little bit of sneaky form without actually having, you know, vir virtually won the week before may well be a, a good way to go. Colsarts was 17th on his penultimate start, so that puts that into context. Alex Noren, um, I mean, he was quite fancy, 16 to 1, but he'd finished third three starts before than a couple of kind of uh, middling performances. Tommy Fleetwood back in 2017, he'd finished fourth and sixth on his previous two starts. Uh, 22 to 1, which is a bit surprising, really. The reason for that is he had missed four consecutive uh, cuts here at um, Le Golf National. So he was coming in with some particularly poor course form, but then turned that all around, one at 22 to 1. And uh, yeah, that, that kind of puts the course form question, I guess, in, into, uh, into question. Because you look at a lot of the recent winners, 13 of the, the last 15 winners here had a top 25 or better in the past. Fleetwood came in with miscut, 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 and then turned it round and won. So I don't think core swarm's a bad thing, um, but uh, I don't get completely hung up on it would be my suggestion here with this. And of course, we've not played since 2019, so... Um, you know things could have changed lots of players have come and gone since that point and uh, yeah, it's, it's not almost a fresh tournament but uh, certainly without and without the continuity there perhaps we'll see something a little bit different this week um, before I go into I've, I've got four selections before I go in is anything either of you guys want to chip in with in terms of the course or the setup or what you like or dislike about the golf national Tough case. Both stuck unexpected <laughs> question, yeah. It is a tough test, yeah. It's, it's uh, rough. Water everywhere. Yeah. Always reminds me, always reminds me of PJ National over in um Florida. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Grinders track. I mean, the Americans in the um Ryder Cup just couldn't get on with it, could they? No. No, and uh that was, you know, the the way it was set up um, was was to kind of favour the Europeans at that point. Mm. Which understandably, you're going to do as much as you possibly can to give yourself an advantage. But it's that kind of course anyway, isn't it? It's that kind of tricky, challenging track where um, you know plodders can often prosper, and that that kind of lends itself to the greens in regulation point, doesn't it? If you if you're just grinding out greens, making the odd putt, 
slowly but surely accumulating a score and uh, and not hemorrhaging bogeys, then that can that can get you to the to the right kind of winning so, total. So you're thinking strokes game ball striking. If we had those numbers, would be absolutely critical for this place. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Yeah, I and mean, if you look at Coles, you know, if, if you were to ask me uh, straight off the bat, describe the best um, asset of Nicholas Colesart, so, you know, other than his uh, longer driving, then I would put him down as a greens in regulation grinder. Mm. Um, Tommy Fleetwood, absolutely the same. So yeah. you know, we've, we've only got this one year of strokes gain data to to look at, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's all of the it's a combination of the long game aspects from a strokes gain perspective that are mm. going to win here. Um, you know, if if some if someone turned up and just had a, an, an incredible putting week, you know, I'd, I'd be surprised if they still just won. But uh, yeah, never say never. That doesn't that doesn't feel favourite Patrick Reed territory, does it? Strokes well, it game ball striking. No, I mean if you, I, I looked at his stats. He hit less than half of his greens in regulation last week at Live Chicago. Mm. So we know that even a well, he does he does have these odd spiky weeks with his long game, Patrick Reed. You, you can't deny that. But in general. Is this kind of 60, 65% greens regulation guy, isn't he? Um, yeah. If, if he's going to go well, then he couples that with incredible week around the greens and on the greens. But if he's yeah. hitting less than 50% coming in, I can't go remotely near that. And as you say, he's the favourite to win this week. Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't back Reed. I wasn't convinced that McIntyre was uh, a, a good bet either. I mean, to go back to back after an emotional win, um, yeah. I, not convinced. Last time he finished sixth on his next start after his win uh, back a couple of years ago, but there were a couple of weeks in between times. This time he's going straight back into uh, action, you know, literally a few days later. So wasn't convinced there. I was, I was more interested in uh, Victor Perez and Thomas Peters. And at the back end of last week, before Perez was playing well, I had him down as one of the, uh, you know, potential players to back this week in this event. But He's really crippled his price by playing so well last week, twenty to one. Mm. And there's just no juice in that for me. I don't think we know how the Gallics play play um, golf as well. What's the What's the French record in their home open? I wouldn't yeah, be surprised got Thomas if you told Levay, me it's very it? poor. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to go back to Thomas Levay. I did look at Perez's um, record in France in general at all levels, and it was just it, it, there wasn't enough there to take a uh, take a chance mm. on at the price um, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes well I wouldn't be surprised if he's in and around the top 10 to be honest but could he really push on for a win uh, yeah not convinced but he is playing well so um, you know I don't be surprised if he pops up over the next few weeks or so Paul question just on going back to the course of it mm. um, this is now taking place in September versus pretty much every year it took place end of June early July I always remember the year going into the Ryder Cup when Justin Thomas came over and was taking on a few of the par fours and won. The ball was bouncing and rolling a lot. I mean, are we kind of looking at that level of bounciness now, even though it is September, or a little bit kind of the sting taken out of it? No, I think it is. It's reportedly quite firm, and I can understand that. I mean, even though we've had, you know, we're we're a few hundred miles further north here, but even though we've had a bit of rain. Um, in the last few weeks, the ground is still absolutely rock hard, and um, you know it's it, it's similar by all accounts over there. I'm expecting it to play. I, I am expecting it to play really quite linksy. Is is my kind of view on it? I think that's the uh, that's the style of golf. That's the style of play that is going to be um, that we're going to see this week. And yeah, I, it, it takes uh, driving distance out of the equation. I think because players will have to pick and choose their clubs based on how the ball is running out. Um, but then that also puts more of an emphasis on playing well from tee to green. You you know you're going to need to be quite accurate. You're going to need to be hitting lot, lots of greens. Um, and uh, yeah, being, being able to handle the conditions. I think so. So yeah, interesting to see how it plays. But yeah, I, 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 if it had been a few weeks further on and you're starting to get a bit more moisture into the ground, then I could see it playing differently. But um, we're not quite yeah. there yet. It's um, it's probably early enough in the autumn for it still to be uh, still to be quite challenging from a from a firmness so perspective. Relative to par, we're probably looking at a pretty grindy week. 
I think so. Maybe, yeah, maybe not quite. Maybe maybe touching to double digits if somebody gets going. Yeah, I yeah. I, if I, if I was taking a punt on it now, I'd probably go for twelves. I think twelve under would probably be the number. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll see next week how wildly inaccurate that uh, prediction was. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I boiled it down. I've gone for four in total this week. I have started my team with the talent that is Ewan Ferguson, fifty to one. I got with Paddy Power seven places each way, a fifth of the odds, and that price is available right now with Paddy Power. And I thought that was outstanding from a player who has had an outstanding year. Um, he won in Qatar. He won a Galgorm Castle. Didn't do anything wrong at Denmark when Denmark a couple of weeks back, did he? It's only that Oliver Wilson hold those absolute bombs on the back nine that prevented him winning from a third title. Um, those two wins came at seven under and twelve under. That's absolutely in the right ballpark, I think, as to what we should expect. And Doha, where he won that first event, is always a good barometer for me for inland linksy style courses. Now, if you look at Colsarts, if you look at Fleetwood, you look at Wiesberger, we've talked about them all being greens in regulation machines. Ferguson currently sits second for greens in regulation on the DP World Tour for the season. Now, the player in first place on that stack, greens in regulation, is Jordan Smith, 22 to 1. 22 to 1, Ewan Ferguson's 50 to 1. Now, in my view, if you were to put those two players head to head on a Sunday, so they're they're both four four shots lead, four shots ahead of the rest of the field, going into the final day head to head, who wins that tournament? Ewan Ferguson or Jordan Smith? For me, it's Ewan Ferguson every single time. It's given what we've seen this this year and given how we've seen him progress. Smith tends to kind of fall away. Ferguson seems to find a way to get himself into a very, very strong, potentially winning position. And he's twice the price. I, I couldn't get it. I couldn't I couldn't quite understand it. So just to, just had to take it. 50 to 1, stuck him up top and um, and uh, we'll see how he fares. But I've gone to our DP World Tour predictor model, mm. which is available to all of the listeners. I will put a link through to it in the description box of this podcast. I have maximised 10 out of 10. Strokes gained off the tee, strokes gained on approach, greens in regulation. Pure ball striking. Top five. Five, Dodo Molinari. Four, Victor Perez. We've already mentioned him. Three, Antoine Rosner. You were all over him last week. Mm-hmm. So was I. Two, Jordan Smith. Number one, Ewan Ferguson. Well, there you go. The stats back it up. But yeah. I, absolutely. I... I you know, you could go as, um, as as simple as that in terms of the the key components, and that could throw you out what could be a really quite likely set of contenders. And I think you and Ferguson fifty to one is a great bet this week, absolutely mm. great bet. So, so here's in. I've also backed Tjorbjorn Olsen um, thirty five to one. Now I backed him with uh, the eight way eight places each way option with bet three six five. He's shown some really positive signs since returning after the birth of his second child at the end of August. 22nd in Himalayan, and there's a pair of 66s in there. Now, he hit 82% of Green's regulation that week. That was his best GIR stat for over two years. And that's the kind of number that, when I see that about Olsen, it's a big green light for a future tournament, if I think one's going to fit. Um, which, given his record here, I think it may well do. Last time out, 16th last week at uh, in, in Italy. Um, progressive for strokes going off the tee, progressive for strokes going tee to green. And what we know with Olsen is he can often pop up with these really sparky putting weeks. And if you get one of those that combines and collides with one of these high greens and regulation weeks, then that's when he wins. Um, it could be a real danger this week, I think. Now, he was second here on debut back in 2011. Um, he was third in 2017. So a couple of decent spins here. Missed cuts in there as well. He's missed four cuts, I think. He's withdrawn as well one year. But if the irons are in, in form at the moment, then um, it's quite possible that he wins, I think. Going back to the Ryder Cup that was held here, he did play. He beat Jordan Spieth in the Sunday singles five and four. So he's got some uh, some good memories of playing here. And again, we talked about Danny Willett in terms of this um, Ryder Cup, you know, potentially making the Ryder Cup team. 
Shane Lowry, Bob McIntyre last couple of weeks, they've already thrown their hat in the ring. Thorbjorn Nelson is that a name that potentially could fit that narrative further down the line? I think he probably could do if he has a, you know, has a good good run from here over the next twelve months. Then uh, why not? Why not make his second Ryder Cup team? We shall see. So Olsen's in um, slightly longer price. I've backed Tom Lewis um, eighty to one with the bet three six five option again eight places each way. He's showing some decent signs, Lewis. Fourth after 36 holes at the Himalayan. Um, faded away a little bit there. Third to halfway last week. Now, he got paired with Rory and Matt Fitz going into Saturday, which may have just thrown him out of kilter a little bit. He shot 40 on his outbound nine and um, paired alongside those two. Rallied a bit after that, but uh, still couldn't uh, get, get much closer to the lead. Finished in the tie for 16th, I think, or thereabouts in the end. But even so, he seemed really positive on Instagram. Um, I think he should be, really. Second from greens in regulation last week. First for strokes gained approach. 11th for strokes gained seed to green. They're the kind of numbers that I want to see about the winner this week. So if he can repeat that, then all well and good. Uh, twice a winner in Portugal um, at Villamora. And Villamora's got some good links to this with some of the recent winners here. There's lots of uh, lots of correlation there, which I've put into my preview this week. Much easier test Villamora, um, and I've kind of accepted that as a fact. Uh, looking through Tom Lewis, though, or looking, looking through his record, he can score, he can play on tougher tests, which um, is encouraging. He was fifth at Walton Heath um, back in 2019 at four under par. He was third in the Dubai Desert Classic the following year, seven under par. He was second, you remember this, he was second at TPC Southwind um, mm-hmm. in 2020. Yeah, that was ten under, and Southwind's another one of these tricky, Tough. challenging tr- Past tracks. Past seventy, absolutely. water everywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. for him to finish at WGC level, as it was at the time, um, second there, that's a really good barometer, I think. Mm. Now, the thing that would put some punters off is the fact that he's played here three times. He's missed the cut on each occasion. Now, I talked about Fleetwood before. He had four consecutive missed cuts, then came and won here. Lewis. If you look at how he was playing on each of those occasions, it was nowhere near where he is right now. His long game is far, far better. Um, I've taken a chance on him this week. I think he can turn that round and put himself a contending performance in on this course. I see no logical reason why he he can't. I see no logical reason why the course doesn't suit his eye. I just think um, he's not been playing well enough when he's come here in the past. So... So yeah, back to back Tom Lewis. The final one I've backed at a longer price is Soren Kjeldsen. Now I backed Kjeldsen with seven places each way, a fifth of the odds bet Fred, 175 to one. And if there's one player that can handle a grind, it is Soren Kjeldsen. Three of his four wins have been at single digits under par. Uh, you remember he won at Royal County Down, the Irish Open at two under par. Now he beat Wiesberger and Eddie Pepper in the uh, in the playoff there. Wiesberger clearly a winner here in the past. Um, he's won at Valderrama. He's got a couple of t- t- second place finishes at Valderrama over the years to back that up as well. So, um, and as we know, Valderrama is one of the most challenging courses on the DP World Tour schedule. Six top twenties here, a further three top tens as well. And recently, 7th at the Hero Open, 5th at Wentworth a week or so ago. At Wentworth, he was 12th for strokes gained approach, 5th for strokes gained tee to green. So long games working, lots of experience here. Long, long price for Soren Kjeldsen, particularly for a guy who's finished 5th in the very recent past at Rolex Series level. I think he's worth a punt at uh, 175 to 1. Then by 4, Kjeldsen Lewis. Thorbjorn Olsen and Ewan Ferguson. Who you got your eye on, Barry? <clears throat> I hadn't read your uh, tips until I figured out a couple of uh, picks. And I was talking to one of my friends about Soren Kelson uh, over the weekend when we were on the course. Mm. We kind of both remarked that he uh, popped his head up at the BMW. And I just said, like, he, he seems to have this... Um, have it very dialed in that when he gets on a course that's not too long, he, he can just up the game for the week and contend. And um, yeah, th- th- this seems, especially that it's going to be running a bit faster, it kind of negates that little bit of distance that um, the Golf National has. And I think uh, 
yeah, that kind of matches up quite nicely for me to, to add him in, put a little bet on him this week. Mm. Yeah, I concur. It, it would be some hit if he did win now, having not won for so long, but he has... Uh, yeah, he's got the, the star quality. Yeah, he's got the winning quality, so let's see. Be a yeah. nice catch. It's all the rage nowadays, Barry, to break these big, long, winless streaks with a... Uh, well, not, not an out-of-the-blue win, because I don't think it would, given that you finished fifth at uh, Wentworth. He, he was tied for the lead going into the final day, just to, you know, what, 10 mm-hmm. days or so ago. So, yeah, I think the price is fantastic on him this week, I must say. That 175 is very nice for somebody who finished fifth at a... Like, I mean, you'd have to say that Wentworth would kind of give you a similar enough um, set of questions yeah. to the Golf National. Like, not, you know, it's not exactly identical, hit, but, you know, I always think about Wentworth of just get, you know, maneuver your ball around and get it on the green um, in regulation and then just see how the putter goes. Yep. No, absolutely. It's not a fun course to be scrambling uh, around. Mm. Yes. Any others catch your eye? Um, I might put another outside bet or two, maybe like Mike Lorenzo Vera or Victor Dubuisson. Just it's just I don't know what it is. <laughs> it, the, the, the small bit of French man in me wants to back a French person <laughs> <laughs> to uh, to do well in his home open. Um, yeah, I like I do. You and Ferguson bet actually. That's that's um, I backed him there a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, he seems like a very very good golfer to uh could be a very nice bet this week considering some of the prices that are up there like i i would much rather back you and ferguson at 50 to 1 than victor prez at 18 to 1 or 16 to 1 whatever he is yep no absolutely i think i think there's a bit of juice in that price personally mm. what about you Steve? podcast favorite he's 63rd in the race to dubai right now mm I'm seeing him very, very um, towards the upper echelons when I'm looking at strokes gain off the tee, strokes gain on approach on our on our uh, predictor model. Yeah, and I love his record here. He's had an eleventh and a fifth from his last three, mm-hmm. and his form reads twenty three, four, thirteen, twenty seventh last week, thirteenth at Wentworth, Matthew Southgate. 55 to 1, eight places each way. Bet 365 each way extra. I'm on. It is his kind of course, isn't it? Oh, God, yeah. Got a lot to play for, hasn't he? This week, next week, you would assume that he's got a half decent record at um, St Andrews as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, such nearly, a, nearly, nearly won, didn't he? Such a coastal course, Lynx golf specialist. Yeah. They had a good season. I mean, six. I was actually taken aback by the fact that he's sixty third in the race to the bye. He could get to that top fifty. Could get all the way to the DP World to a championship at the end of the year. Yeah, that's a great year for Southgate if he can do that. And again, if we're talking about players, where if you looked at their stats post event and you saw Matthew Southgate having hit eighty two percent of greens and regulation. It wouldn't you wouldn't blink because you, you you could quite accept and understand and um you know almost expect that to happen and when he's playing well which he has been playing well that is his game um yeah I I couldn't put you off Steve really couldn't here are his luck going I'm going strokes gained on approach since the Hero Open 31st of July 19th he then had a negative when he missed uh, when he withdrew at the Kazoo Open since then 13th fifth fourth. 41st last week at the Italian Open but he was and he's, he's off the tee games fantastic as well mm. so yeah I think it fits Southgate yep. to a tee lots to like yeah I was wondering also and it's not the most exciting of bets but there's a guy that's very close to cracking the world's top 50 for Christmas and we know what that brings that brings that lovely feeling and sound of a Augusta National invite hitting your doormat mm. around the festive period. I just wonder about Ryan Fox. I keep seeing Ryan Fox in a lot of stats. I know he withdrew at Wentworth, 
Yes, and that was with an injury. So that um, was an injury. So yeah. yeah, you never know, do you? No, and he might be fine. Um, I think you just need, you need to be wary of these kind of new yeah. issues. But yeah, that that was the one thing that put me off because again, like Southgate, you'd look at him in terms of the fit to mm. the course, and it, yeah. it works very nicely. But yeah, I, yeah, that was enough to put me off. But again, you know, beware the injured golfer. He, he could be he could be absolutely fine coming into this and. Uh, yeah, as you say, there's lots of pl- lots to play for for him. I like your Ferguson reasoning. Love Tom Lewis. We know his history on Lynx courses. The other one that we always talk about at Lynx courses, and we often back, but no one's mentioned him so far because he is quite short in betting terms. Marcus Kinholt. Mm. Two missed cuts, but are we worried about missed cuts around Wentworth and in Rome last week. That's not his game, is it? No. But no. you then look before that third. And two twenty-third positions in his last four prior to those two missed cuts. He's got a fifth here and an eleventh here. Yep. When he goes back to a course where he's done well in the past, he can just spring back to life. And yeah, I, I gave him good consideration. Um, but yes, uh, again, I, <laughs> I I couldn't I couldn't put you off. I don't think I wouldn't wouldn't push you away from that bet if you fancy it. He is surrounded by a perennial, you know, someone like a Tristan Lawrence, who we know has won recently, 55-1. to 1. He does beg the question why he's shorter than a Tristan Lawrence. But, um, yeah. The other one i also got a slight suspicion about is Laurie Cantor. Mm. But, all, you know, I, I still don't like... I still think that when these live guys come back to the main tours, they're, they're you know, the, with all of the issues and the, the you know, the... The back scratching that's going on on the on the range, and I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. But sixty six to one would look a big price for Laurie Cantor. Yeah, yeah. If he actually si- comes to the party, the guy who finished eighth with- last week in Chicago. Yeah, similar argument with Adrian Otegi as well. It was, uh, I yeah, I I've kind of veered away from the live guys to a certain degree. Um, just to see how they get on, because I think you're right. I think there's a bit of uh, the, the, the stuff going on in the background, isn't there? Which um, which can't be if if it's just got to be a little bit unsettling, I think, for some of these players. Yeah. But yeah, undoubtedly talented. So we shall see. It should be a good event. It's always mm. one of my highlights on a DP World Tour. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This course and this tournament. Mm. Yeah, always well supported in terms of fans as well. So it should be it should be a decent decent outing, I think. Anything to add, Barry? Are we are we done for the week? I think we're good. We so, have, yeah. by my reckoning, a very decent week next week, haven't we? We've got the um, Dunhill Links up at St Andrews. Yep. Uh, Rory McIlroy in attendance for that one, and we have the Sanderson Farms Championship. Uh, on the PGA Tour. So a double header next week as we move inexorably towards the end of the season. Thank you for your time, chaps. I hope your bets go well. Yep. Best of luck, guys. You too, boys. Best of luck to the listeners in terms of their bets. And we will see you again next week. Cheerio. If you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved all the stats and the tips and so much more cause it's the golf betting system the golf